That is on misconceptions about God. We're at the very, very end of this quarter. Just a couple of very brief practical notes here. Several of you noticed that we went from lesson 11 to lesson 13, and you were asking about lesson number 12. Lesson 12 is on the providence of God. As you know, we missed a week because of our spring gospel meeting. So this particular quarter of Sunday morning classes only had 12 weeks. Our material had 13 lessons. The providence of God, lesson number 12, was the logical one to cut because we've got an entire quarter coming up on the providence of God. But that being said, if you would like a copy, a paper copy of lesson number 12, if you will see me afterwards, and we'll be sure to get you a copy of that if you are interested in that. So that is why we have moved from lesson 11 to lesson 13 If you'd like a copy of lesson number 12, just for your own records, please be sure to see me. The other uh, note for our family here, two weeks from today, Lord willing, is when our summer quarter worth of Bible classes, at least on the adult level, begins. We've been handing out this packet, that is lesson number one, Lord willing. Two weeks from today, we begin talking about grace as God's power to overcome sin. We're saying two weeks from today because, of course, one week from today is the start of our vacation Bible school. Lord willing, Doug Roush will be with us this time next Sunday morning to kick off that series of lessons on spiritual fitness. Okay, so we definitely would love to see you at this point next Sunday morning. That will not be a typical Bible class. Lord willing, two weeks from today is when we will get our Uh, new series of Bible classes started. If you've got any questions about that, please feel free to see me afterwards and we'll do our best to, to answer any questions. But for this morning, we're in lesson number 13. If you haven't turned back there, turn in your Bibles back to Psalm 50, where we will be in just a moment. Let's start off, if you will bow with me with a word of prayer, and then we will get our, our class started for the morning. Our great Father in heaven, thank you so much for the promise that you hear us. Help us this morning to calm our spirits, to be still in our hearts, and to know that you are God. You are the one who has always been, you are the one who is, and will always be. You are our eternal creator. We thank you that we can humble ourselves under your mighty hand this morning. We thank you for the time that we've had over the course of the last three months to focus on you and on your awesome nature. We pray that we would continue to grow in our understanding and our appreciation of who you are, and what that means for us and our time on this earth. We pray that you would be with all who are studying and teaching throughout this building this morning. We pray that you would bless us as we do our best to speak the truth, love the truth, stick with the truth, and and share that truth in love. Help us always to have good and honest hearts as we handle your word. We thank you so much for our risen Savior, your Son, and our King. And it is in His name that we pray this morning. Amen. Okay. Obviously, we cannot take the time even briefly to talk about where we have been over the course of this quarter. We've been talking about the nature of God, and we draw that series of lessons to a close by noticing some common misconceptions about God. Hopefully you had the time to look at the material. If you didn't, then I would encourage you to go back and look at that in much more detail. We start off this morning in Psalm 50 and verse 21 that emphasizes for us, misconceptions about God are not a 21st century phenomenon. And the idea of trying to impress upon 
people the seriousness of having misconceptions about God. That is not a new and, and uh, pressing sort of urgency that God's people feel. In Psalm 50 verse 21, the psalmist says, These things you have done. We could say more accurately, God speaking through the psalmist. These things you have done and I have been silent. You thought, God says, that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Why is it so very serious? Why would God speak in language of rebuke when people think of Him like just another human being? Why is it a big deal, a serious deal, A serious misconception to think of God in terms like us. Phil? Okay. Yeah. We're bringing Him down to our level. And uh, that is going to breed all sorts of misconceptions about his ways, about his feelings, about his thoughts and his judgments. Alan, go ahead, and then Steve. The young lady we had in here on the day on homosexuality, mm-hmm. and she was convinced with a bunch of others and that at the day that the public says it's like that what they let's say it's okay. Uh huh. Pride Week downtown. They had thought that. We can do this if we can find scripture that we can find in the Bible. Okay. That God will allow us to do. This. Okay. And that's it. There are many people, and if we're honest with ourselves, we understand that sometimes we see it in our own selves as fallible human beings who want to do something and then are going to do whatever they have to do or whatever we have to do to twist God and His will to match our preconceived notions or wants or or, or needs. That is something that mankind has been doing for a very, very, very long time. And it is a very big deal when we do not treat God and His will as objective, beyond us, something to be submitted to, right? Rather than making God or fashioning God in our own image. Steve and then Vanessa, why is this a big deal? Okay. Yeah, that's an important point that's going to be brought out in this lesson. He's not bound the way that we are by human bodily limitations or even by the, the limitations of time or space. Vanessa, go ahead. Okay. Absolutely. And I think sometimes because the scriptures are silent on some issues, people will say, well, he didn't mean to say, he did not say we can do this. So right. We can just go ahead and do this and he'll just understand because he didn't specifically tell us no. Right. There is a time that God has chosen to be silent or to be patient or to be long-suffering. But if we've learned anything this quarter, we understand that all of those characteristics must be viewed in light of everything that He's told us, right? And He has told us that there is going to be a time when His long-suffering and His patience with this world comes to an end. To neglect that great truth is not to appreciate the whole counsel of God. Dwight, go ahead. Hey, uh, when, uh, looking at it is, uh, when we bring God down to our level, it says that we're not able to direct our own footsteps. Okay. Now we bring God down to our level, it says, okay, we can direct our own footsteps. Okay. We can do that. Absolutely. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Here in in Psalm 50, God says, You thought that I was one like yourself. We've talked a little bit about that. We've even had shades in this brief discussion of Romans chapter 1 and verse 22. If you're looking, once you've turned that, if 
you're looking at your material, page 127, that second paragraph, the authors do a good job of framing this discussion for us. They say, many people today mistakenly think that God thinks and feels as they do. They foolishly believe, to Vanessa's point, that God approves or disapproves whatever they approve or disapprove. They measure God with themselves as the standard. The erroneous human standard causes them to be ignorant of the true nature of God and to develop false concepts of God. And and what is it that is created by that? That is, of course, idolatry. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 22, Paul describes the problem this way. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they make an exchange. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. That's not like us, right? He is different. But we are making an exchange in our hearts. Exchanging the immortal God for things that we can wrap our minds around, right? And see and touch and handle and perhaps most profoundly control. We like the idea of a God who can give us what we want as long as we can maintain some measure of control. And God diagnoses that in no uncertain terms as idolatry. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The authors go on to emphasize several basic, basic things. God's thoughts... And His ways are higher than our ways. That's Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. The Lord does not see or make judgments the way that we make judgments. That becomes very clear in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. For us to be so blind or arrogant to say, well, I think God thinks this because that's the way that I think. I think that God feels like this because this is the way that I feel. I think God would want me to be happy because this is what makes me happy. That is a serious problem. Serious problem, a a serious deficit in the way that we view the authority of God from the very, very beginning. Down at the bottom of page 127, the authors tell us that idols are man's vain attempt to make their God conform to their way of thinking. And the authors go on to describe a a variety of different ways that this happens. If you've got your Bibles open and would like to turn them back to Acts chapter 17, they, they, they tell us up at the top of page 128, we don't worship, of course, in this culture at this point in time, material gods. We don't go out and set those sorts of things up in our backyards and physically bow down to those things, but... At the level of the mind and the heart, at the level of someone reigning on the throne of our hearts, it is very easy for us, for our conceptions of God to become misguided just like these people of thousands of years ago. What are we talking about here? They say many mistakenly think that God is a racial God, that He is going to... Uh, look down with favor on one particular group of people over another. Now, of course, we understand that historically, God had a chosen nation. And maybe this is where some of those echoes come from. But what was the point, according to God Himself, for watching over and preserving that nation of Israel in that period of what we call the Old Testament. What was he doing there? What was the point of that? Preparing people for the coming of the Messiah. Absolutely. He tells them over and over and over again, it's not because you were the biggest, it's not because you were the richest, 
It's not because you above everyone else were more holy innately than everybody else. It's because he chose them. And he had a specific purpose in mind. Going all the way back there to Genesis 12 where he talks to Abraham. He was going to provide them a great land and he was going to make of them a great nation. But the point was through this family line, the king, the Messiah would come, right? And he would be a blessing not just to that one people group, but to all of the nations of the earth. And for us, on the other end of that historical fulfillment, now to treat God as if He is somehow racially biased against anyone is to entirely miss the point. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 25, Paul is standing as a Jew in Athens. And if we had time, we could read verses 24 through 28 that flesh this idea out more. But the big point for our purposes this morning is verse 25. He himself, our creator, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Just how much do people mean to him? First Timothy three and or First Timothy two and verse three. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He does not possess any racial prejudice. Romans two and verse eleven. Paul deals with Jews. He deals with Gentiles. We all fall short of His glory. And in relation to His dealings with mankind, He shows no partiality. As those who are His redeemed children, who are doing our best to model our own nature after His nature, for us to do what He does not do would be unrighteous, ungodly, unholy okay let's turn in our bibles back to psalm 90 and verse 2 where we'll be in just a moment misconception number two many mistakenly think that god is dead nearly 40 years ago at this point of course time magazine uh, caused all sorts of publicity stirs around the world when they had that famous uh, cover pronouncing god is dead Uh, Steve brought up uh, several minutes ago, of course, God is not subject to disease or death. What about us is subject to those things? That's our bodies, right? That's not our spirits. Those are our bodies. And in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God's own Son emphasizes the spiritual nature of God. Or we've got our Bibles open to Psalm 90 and verse 2 where the psalmist poetically puts it this way. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting, we could say in the past, to everlasting in the future, you are God. We spent significant time in week three of this study talking about God as Yahweh, right? The one who is. Many mistakenly think that God is growing old or feeble. Of course, that is not the case when we're talking about a being who is eternal, who is not bound within the limitations of Time That goes back to the very idea of I am. You and I can't say that. We are in the the context of time and we uh, have these painful reminders sometimes over and over and over again that time is very limited and, and our existence within this dimension of time is so very short. Not God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You and I can't say anything 
even remotely in the same orbit as that sort of thing. Isaiah 40 and verse 28, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint. He does not grow weary the way that you and I do. His understanding is unsearchable. Up there in the first full paragraph of page 129, the authors make an important practical point off of this weighty, glorious idea. They say, first full paragraph, page 129, it is very irreverent to refer to the Almighty God as the old man upstairs. We ought not to do that as those who who fearfully uh, and joyfully work in His service. We must always speak to Him and about Him with heartfelt reverence. This next point, many mistakenly think that God forgets His promises. Maybe it's easy for us to do that because we understand we have made promises before and we've forgotten to fulfill them, right? Or other people have made promises to us and they have forgotten them. Or or, or somehow we get it in our minds, well, uh, it's one thing to say something, but it's another thing to actually do it. Not God. He's not like us in that respect. 2 Peter 3 and verse 3, Peter says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of His coming? We know He made a promise, but ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. To which Peter goes on to say, listen, He's not like you and me. He is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness. He's outside of the boundaries of time, right? This is the context in which we're told with Him, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. He's patient towards you. And to scoff in the face of such long suffering is the height of foolishness. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That is not His wish. The Hebrew writer says, He who promised is faithful. Somewhat along those same lines, many mistakenly think that God will forget their sins for which they have not repented. We think, uh, again, in terms of limitation and in terms of choosing not to think of certain things or overlooking some things altogether, not seeing some things or with the, the progress of time forgetting certain things, not God. Psalm 10 and verse 11, he says in his heart, this wicked man who views God with his his own conceptions, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Not true is the point of Psalm 10. Many, the authors point out from Romans chapter 1, are like the Gentiles who did not see fit to acknowledge God. And God gives them over to a a, a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. But one of the major points of Romans chapter 1 is God is still going to hold all of us accountable. Which makes the Gospel, of course, such wonderful, wonderful News. They go on on page 130. Many mistakenly think that God can lie. We spent a significant amount of time 
talking about that in more detail several weeks ago. Many mistakenly think that God can be deceived. That somehow, some way, either He's just going to be like this grandfatherly figure who, who says that I shouldn't do that but really isn't going to hold me accountable, or maybe I can just pull one over on Him altogether. And, and he, He's not really going to do or see or acknowledge things that we've been talking about this quarter. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 simply says, do not be deceived. You choose to think in those terms, and it's not God who's being deceived. It's we ourselves who are being deceived. God is not mocked. Many mistakenly think that God can be bribed. How do people think in those sorts of terms? Bribing God, how, how could we ever do that? Or how, even as modern Americans, maybe do we slip into this idea of bribing God? Jeff, go ahead. This is our prayer will we'll ask God, well, if you do this for me, I, I will make sure I show up. And yeah. <laughs> I, and that is, you know, we, we chuckle at that because we understand just how common even maybe we see that in our own selves. We, we maybe barter with God in our prayers. God, if you will do this, then I will do that. Is God some sort of a merchant that has to be talked into seeking my best interest? Not at all. Does He need Anything that I and only I can provide. Not at all. Again, that, that's thinking of God and trying to deal with God in very human, very self-centered terms. How else do we, maybe from a practical point of view, live as if we can bribe God? Go ahead, Mark. People think they do good deeds. Yeah. No yeah. This ancient human idea that we see thousands of years ago in the inscriptions of the Egyptians and the pottery of the Grecians and the architecture of the Romans, the idea of a great scale, right? That, that in terms of judgment and the afterlife, God is watching over a great scale and all of your bad deeds are on one side and all of your good deeds are on the other. And so if you just do enough good deeds to outweigh the bad deeds, then somehow God will be appeased. Is there anything in the Bible that would ever point us to that? Not at all. In the Bible it is, your wicked deeds are so weighty and cast such an aspersion on the, great or the glory of God, there isn't anything you can put in that other pan that is somehow going to bribe God into granting you something. No, not at all. That's the very meaning of greats, right, that we're going to talk about in more detail in a couple of weeks. The authors on page 131, that second full paragraph, talk about a variety of different ways that we do this. God does not overlook our sins because we often come to worship services. Very immature way of thinking, right? That, well, you know, I know I shouldn't have done what I did on Saturday night, but if I'm in church on Sunday morning, God will be okay with it. Uh, completely flies in the face of everything that we've talked about this quarter, right? Uh, God does not overlook our sins because we do good deeds or give liberally to His church. There isn't any amount of money that I can somehow give to make God's favor shine down on me. For a Christian to receive God's forgiveness, he must repent. She must confess her sins with a broken and a contrite heart. Let's make sure that when we think of God, we think of Him in the terms He has revealed. Many mistakenly think that God does not look upon sin as something terrible. And we've talked about that throughout this quarter, how God feels about sin and iniquity. It is no laughing, trivial, half-hearted sword of matter. Going along with that, many mistakenly think that God is mean or cruel and delights 
somehow, just, just waiting in heaven with thunderbolt and earthquake in his hand to somehow punish the next person who does something with, with some sort of a bloodlust in his heart. Not at all. Ezekiel 33, at one of the darkest periods in Israel's history, God speaks to Ezekiel and says, You tell these descendants of Abraham, As I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. That is God's will. For his creation. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die? O house of Israel. God is not going to compromise who he is. But there is no excuse for us to live as if he does not care. That's the bottom line. Many mistakenly think that God is love. And will not punish anyone eternally in hell. Is God love? Of course He is. We spent significant time three weeks ago talking about God is love. But for us to zero in on one aspect from a human point of view of love and latch on to this as well, this is the sum total of who God is without any regard for everything else. Holiness and godliness and righteousness and fierce wrath is again to to make an idol in our own minds and, and to fashion God in our image. Many mistakenly think that God does not know their secret sins. Very easy to debunk in the Bible. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Hebrews 4 No creature is hidden from His sight. Many mistakenly believe that God will allow one to disobey Him if it makes me happy. To uh, one of, of Alan's points earlier, some foolishly reason. Well, God would want me to be happy. Therefore, what He said really doesn't apply my my own conception of happiness is somehow more important than what his son spoke into the history of mankind. How very, 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 very short-sighted and selfish. Many mistakenly think that God approves of all manifestations of religion today. Of course, to which... Uh, one of the, the primary passages that we could go is Jesus in John chapter 17 and His prayer for unity. How is it that, that human beings from so many different points of view and backgrounds and cultures, how could we possibly be one other than uniting around some objective, God-breathed standard beyond ourselves, right? To, to set aside this chronological snobbery that says, well, you know, where I am now is the, the height of human enlightenment and knowledge and wisdom. And so my, my ideas now somehow outweigh ideas from long ago or geographical snobbery or cultural snobbery, whatever it is. Setting all of that aside and going back to what is actually from God, preserved by God, the sort of unity that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4. Alan, very quickly, go ahead. What do you think about the practice of presence? Practice of presence being the presence of God all the time. Don't you? Well, not the gospel speak, specifically monks and their Yeah, I mean, uh, of course there are those who do all sorts of religious things in this world all, for all sorts of motivations. But we understand... The power of God for salvation is the gospel. Which by its very nature communicates the fact that we are helpless in desperate need of a Savior. Right? That there is nothing we can do apart from that gospel to somehow merit or earn or attain some level 
uh, of salvation, right? One of the very first steps in being reconciled to God is to acknowledge our very, very, very great need. The authors have one final passage of Scripture there at the very end of this workbook that, that really encapsulates in many ways everything that we've talked about before. We spent about a year and a half ago significant time trying to appreciate the beautiful infant church in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago and how much we could learn from them. One of the things that stands out about them in Paul's first letter, he was only able to be there for just a few weeks, as best we can tell, in the book of Acts. And he's torn away from them because of persecution. And now he's riding back to them and he's, he's nurturing them like a mother and building them up like a father. But he says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, the people around you report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What a great way to bring this quarter to a close. There is a living God. He is the true God. And our responsibility is to turn away from all that is not Him. All distortions of Him. Our greatest need, week number one, is to know Him. I appreciate very much your attendance, your interaction all throughout this quarter. One more time, if you would like a paper copy of lesson number 12, I'd be happy to get you a copy of that. If you would, just let me know and we'll try and make those available this morning. Thank you very much for being here.